folks, welcome back to my channel. You can call me Lolly. It is time, it is time to finally film <laughs> some of my favorite books of the year. I've been so behind on filming end of the year content because I got sick right after Christmas. Um, but here we are. Um, so this video is going to be my top 10 fiction reads of the year. And then the next video is going to be my top nonfiction. Yeah. All right. Um, so th these are, I'm kind of going to talk about them, I guess, like in the order that I read them. Okay. First book, you know, I read this fairly early, um, in the year. I read it in like February or something. And my feelings toward it have just kind of, they've just kind of stuck with me and they've kind of been held in high regard all year. Um, this is The Gollum and the Genie by Helene Recker. This is a historical fantasy that follows a golem and a genie in um, turn of the century New York City. The golem, she, um, she is uh, bound to a man who is coming to America um, and he decides to wake her up on the ship on the passage but then he um, passes away and she is left without a master and without guidance and is this human appearing but clearly non-human person who lands in New York and has to contend um, not only with being um, masterless and guideless in this world but also <laughs> figure out how to survive um, and thankfully there is a, um, a rabbi who identifies what she is and you know, realizes both how dangerous she is and realizes that a lot of that is simply her being new to life and not knowing how to navigate the world. He takes her under the wing and kind of teaches her how to pass as human. Um, and then the genie um, has been uh, trapped in a vessel for several thousand years and has made it into the Americas and he is released from his vessel by a metalsmith, again in um, an immigrant quarter, Syrian um, neighborhood in New York City. Um, and, uh, this metalsmith also, um, kind of recognizes what he is, um, and kind of takes him under the wing and tries to teach him how to pass as human. Because part of the, um, the genie's curse is that he is bound in a humanoid body. And it is this very, um, thoughtfully crafted story of, um, immigration and, um, like the old world and the new world and like New York City in like the early 1900s is such a fitting place for it um, because these are very clearly um, old world creatures, old mythological creatures um, and the kind of mythology and magic that surrounds their mythos really has no place in the bustling industrialized new world. So not only are they, you know, non-human entities trying to survive among humans, but they are, are like out of time and out of place trying to survive in this modern world. Um, and eventually these two uh, creatures, entities, um, meet each other and it is um, a whirlwind relationship, friendship, um, that blossoms because it's like, hey, you're like the only other non-human person here, like you kind of know what um, I'm going through, but they're also such character characteristically different people because the genie is a creature of fire, of impulse, of desire, of, of extremities, and the golem is um, very methodical, kind of conservative, very, very, you know, very much like, you know, she is a creature of water and earth, where who is like the complete opposite of this creature of fire. Um, so while they are drawn to each other because they are both mythological creatures, they're also very different personality-wise. It was just a fascinating journey to see them navigate in this world and see their survival. I think it is a a very particular uh, flavor of fantasy. It's very heavy on the historical element and again like on those themes of um, like immigration and you know the old world versus new. Um, it definitely has some very strong characters. It's not quite literary fantasy, but it's kind of more leaning, you know, th th this is a fantasy that will have a very strong appeal to people who read more like just like straight up historical fiction. Um, but there is also like a very personal element of like, I don't know, kind of starting the year off in a funk, you know, kind of recovering from <laughs> the exha exhaustion of the holidays. And this was one that I picked up and 
it was just such a joy to read. I immediately bought the sequel so I could continue on with the story. I think the sequel is also very strong. Um, so yeah, this one has just stuck with stuck in my feelings all year and it absolutely deserves a place on this list. Book number two is The Final Strife by Sarah El Arifi. Um, this was a book that I was lucky enough to read an ARC ebook of from um, NetGalley. Um, I had seen like one or two other people like m maybe like Jesse from Bowties and Books talk about it and really really enjoy it and I read this and again like for how chunky this this thing is I also really devoured it. I thought this was a very very strong um, adult fantasy. I believe it's a debut as well. Very glad to find um, a, a, a secondhand physical copy because I totally miss that there is this lovely map um, in the end pages of the hardcover. Um, I I don't know if a paperback is out yet and if it will have um, those maps in there, but that's that's worth showing now that I have a lovely physical copy. Uh, so this is an adult fantasy that is like Arabic and North African inspired. Roots in the mythology of Africa and Arabia. Three women band together against a cruel empire that divides people by blood. So this is a world where there are three distinct castes of people the ruling class has red blood and they are believed to be the only people who can um, uh, use their particular brand of blood magic. The like poor working class, <laughs> there's not really much of a middle class, but like the working class have blue blood. Um, and uh, this character is um, a character of blue blood and they are the laborers and like higher up servants, but they're still, um, fairly um, oppressed and kept down people um, and then the most underclass almost like practically a slave class the what are they called ghostings they're called ghostings so the most lower class are they're pretty much like the slave class they're called the ghostings and their blood um, is clear and they're very interesting because in the past they led a revolution against the ruling class and um, the revolution failed and as punishment um, not only are they kept in kind of like a slave class um, level of society but every single baby when they are born um, their hands and their tongue are cut off um, but it's interesting because that has led to them um, developing this um, sign language that um, most people, most other classes around them cannot interpret because like, why would you bother to learn the language of the, you know, the, the, the serving class? Um, but that kind of, of arrogance and this assumption that just because that they are like forcibly disabled, there is an arrogance in assuming that that means that they are powerless. And that is a very interesting, um, thread of one of the threads of the story. This title character... Sila, she was raised in um, among like a, a family of people who were plotting a resistance against the um, higher classes and then that um, fell apart. So she has been trained in like fighting and stuff, but she kind of has lost that dream. She has lost contact with revolutionaries and she is now a um, drug addict who makes money by um competing in these fighting rings and then oh i don't remember exactly how but she meets anur um i think i think sila is trying to like infiltrate the palace to steal something and she meets anur who is the daughter of one of the most higher up ruling class women and anur has a secret that even though she is raised in a red blood family, she was actually like switched at birth, but her mother keeps it a secret because her mother doesn't want um, the embarrassment uh, that the revolutionaries made it into their house. Um, but also it, her mother, Anur's mother is also very um, mean to her <laughs> because she's like, you're, you are my shame. You are my secret. Um, but, um, Anur has this dream of competing in these trials that um, 
the winners of that competition um, kind of get to ascend to be part of like the ruling council of the city. Let's see, our ghosting character is Hassa. Um, so each of these three women are now moving in the world in this own way to, and trying to like undo this tyrannical hierarchical system in their own way. Hassa is kind of moving within the system, trying to best this system so that she can gain influence to actually kind of change things from the inside. Sila kind of um, gets reinvigorated with her like outside revolutionary ideas. Um, and is partially using Hassa to that end and is partially doing some other things and that sorry is partially using Anur in that way but is also being pulled by some outside forces um, and then Hassa of course the ghosting the ghostings are maneuvering unseen in very interesting and powerful ways of their own yes it's, it's a first in a series we have a cover for book two which is the god's drums it is beautiful I'm so excited um this is one that I, I definitely <laughs> devoured it and read it really fast and I'm really excited to read it again and kind of like take some more time with it and think about it. Yeah, great. Next, another one that has just kind of like sat in my feelings is Miss Meteor, which is um, co-written by Taylor K. Mejia and Anna Marie Macklemore. And I talk about this a bit in depth in a vlog that I did. I will link that in the cards, whichever side that is, um, and in the description box. Um, so this is a young adult a fantasy. It's very light on the fantasy. It's kind of magical realism. Um, but there is like a clear fantastical element in here. And it follows, follows Chicky and Lita. Lita um, is trying to compete in this local small town beauty pageant. She knows that she's not a good contender. You know, it's usually like the tall, attractive, blonde, white girls who win. And she is short and Latina and a little curvy. Um, but it's kind of like a last hurrah of in regards to something that's going on in her life and also as a form of revenge against some bullies in the town. And she enlists um, her former best friend. They had a falling out at some point, but she enlists Chica, Chiki. Um, and Chicky is queer and kind of awkward and also Latina. So there's, um, you know, so she also has a vested interest in kind of, of sticking, you know, sticking a knife in the side of the bullies of the town. So there's a lot in here about, you know, you know, being um, brown in like a predominantly white town and being queer in a small town and, you know, having, you know, it's one thing to have like one label of otherness. Um, there's an interesting um, trans character in here who is like white, but trans. Um, but because like he is like very gender conforming and his masculinity and his sister is popular and he's white and all these things, like you see how he navigates, you know, he's accepted because he's only got like one label but as soon as you start piling on more and more labels of otherness it starts to get really really hard for these teenagers um but this is a beautiful story of them kind of learning to embrace their own identity um and kind of disregard the opinions of other people um and it you know and kind of bring in kind of their own other misfit found family and um find a lot of joy and solidarity with each other and it was just so heartwarming <laughs> it was it just you know, like even when these kids are going through these hard things there is th these writers still manage to convey like such joy in their experience um so uh definitely um check out that vlog if you want to kind of have more of like a you know section by section reactions of like I've just started this book and here's my reaction and I'm halfway through and here's what we're dealing with um and yeah this like this is also like a like a kind of more contemporary issue young adult fiction which is not really um a genre I gravitate to but there was just something there was something so charming and um uplifting about the story that it's another one that has just stuck with me and I'm like yeah yeah, I got to talk about this one again. The next book is um, an erotic <laughs> romance novel called Saint by Sierra Simone. This is the third book in this series. Book one is called Priest and book two is called Sinner. And it follows three 
brothers in this family where the first brother in the story in the, the brother in the first book is a priest who is dealing with having feelings towards someone um book two follows like the reckless playboy and this book three follows um uh the third brother who kind of used to be like on par with the playboy but then suddenly um had this really rough life epiphany and decided to become a monk <laughs> Um, and this is a story, you know, and this, what makes me need to like talk about and share the story again is the mental health discussion in here. And, um, especially when we get, when the book finally gets to the discussion about like suicide ideation, this is like in one of my top three books I've ever read that in talking about a person's relationship with their suicide ideation and just the way it it, sh it it shows this nuance um, to that mental health state in a way that is very informative and very different from um, a lot of what we think depression looks like. So the overall story of, of this book is um, this guy, I don't have a copy in front of me, so I'm, I'm not going to like remember his name, but he... He kind of was in a relationship with someone and then uh, did they have a breakup he had he had a rough night and the outcome of it was he kind of just like stumbled into a monastery like fine he was like I don't know driving around or got he got no he got like a mysterious text um, and it kind of led to him stumbling into this monastery, like, in his pajamas, like, clearly in distress, but saying, like, I want to join the order. Um, and thankfully, like, the priest who received him kind of recognized the state he was in and was like, okay, take a day to think about it. Here's a, here's a referral to a therapist, because no matter what, like, I want you to talk to this person. Um, take, take some time to think about it, because clearly, like, you are, you are drowning right now, um, but, you know, check off these things, and then we will let you, um, become an initiate and go through, like, this, you know, the, the training process. Um, so eventually he does, um get initiated into the order. He hasn't quite taken vows. He hasn't taken like permanent vows yet, I believe. Um, and he's actually doing pr pretty well. Um, thankfully the monastery that he's at, um, ha he, uh, he was kind of formative in forming a like specifically mental health group, um, where it's like other people who are um, you know, on antidepressants and in therapy and stuff, and, um, recognizing that, like, yes, your faith in God should be strong, should be strong and be helpful in helping, in guiding you through this, um, but also, like, brain chemistry is a thing, and sometimes you need a little, uh, human-made help, um, and it doesn't mean that your faith is any less, it doesn't mean that you are like any less or weaker of a human being for ha for needing that help. Just like a really fictional but really like heartwarming depiction of um, a, a faith community that is actually working for the vested interests of its members rather than just following a blind doctrine. Um, and then uh, the uh, ex boyfriend of our of our monk dude shows up. Um, and then wants to write an article about these uh, monasteries that are known for brewing this um, artisanal beer and like the, the world of um, monastery um, alcohol, monastery alcoholic beverages. Um, and they kind of end up going on this tour of Europe. Um, so then, you know, under the guise of like, you know, research for this article, but then of course the two of them kind of like rekindle their relationship and are kind of like working through what happened and what led to our monk guy um making the decision to try to join the order um and you know and our monk guy is kind of like taking this as like 
I'm, I'm doing this kind of journey to kind of figure out and confirm that this is what I want to do before I take final vows. Um, so it's kind of this last, uh, working out of the, of the issues in the relationship. Um, and then again, like by the time, you know, we get to that conversation of saying like, so what happened that night was I came the closest I've ever come to wanting to commit suicide and like staring into the darkness within me. Um, and this is what that process felt like and this is you know what happened with the text and then like finding this monastery and the, and like this is this like this monastery and finding it like saved my life <laughs> um and kind of talking through like what that process was um and it was amazing <laughs> um I mean, this is definitely not going to be everybody's cup of tea because, you know, sometimes the, the mixing of the, the spiritual and the erotic is something some people don't want to do. Um, I really like that in several of Sierra Simone's work, she really wrestles with the blending of spirituality and sensuality and being like, okay, but like desire and human bodies and intimacy are human things and all human and you know what, if human things are created by God, then he created these things too. And, you know really wrestling with like what is the definition of like pro pro like where is that line between profane and sacred and you know ritual and like um and one of her, her other she's also known for like her thorn chapel series which is like the mixing of like christianity and like pagan um ritual um and i, I really like it i really like um how she kind of uses that as a framework to like explore um, human sexuality and shame and desire and as you know and also like as a guiding framework of forming um honest and strong human relationships and uh yeah lives in my feelings rent free all the time the next book i got to talk about is a half-built garden by ruthana emrys this was another book that i got an arc ebook of it's a very philosophical fantasy uh, not fantasy sorry science fiction very philosophical science fiction so this takes place in near-ish future earth like maybe like a hundred hundred and fifty years from now maybe like a hundred years from now um and earth the earth it's not so much divided by like countries and nation states as it is by like there's like nation states there's um like a corporatist entity like the world has kind of like rejected corporations as wor a world power and rejected their like consumerism and their pollution and their morals but they but like corporations still exist and they still manufacture things that people need but corporations have kind of formed their own like nation state um and then um, what also has emerged are like instead of countries, there's like watershed networks, there's like um, ecological um, nation states. Um, and our protagonist is a um, queer woman who is uh, has um, is a fairly new mother with her partner, and she lives kind of in like a, a, a joint. Um, like a co-parenting situation with another couple who have a child that's her family makeup and she's kind of like a spokesperson for her local watershed network which i believe is like the chesapeake watershed network um and in this like past hundred years or whatever um humanity has done a lot to undo um the pollution and um human created causes of climate change and they're really on the track to um, restore a lot of ecological balance with the world. Our protagonist wakes up in the middle of the night because she's getting some weird signals in her watershed network and she and her partner go out there and they make this and they make a, what turns out to be a very smart decision to carry their children with them to see this and they discover that like an alien spaceship has <laughs> landed and um, so they have so they inadvertently are you know the first contact of humans with aliens and it's very and i say it's very fortunate that they took their children with them because the alien species on this planet um really has a lot you know um they carry their children with them you know children's and family structures are very important to them um and part of the uh reasoning for that is like okay but like children ground you and they 
keep your priorities you know they make you remember like why why are you doing this like what is the better world that you are working for and it's also like a safety net because it's like you're not going to harm me if i'm physically holding my child in front of in front of me and vice versa like it's also a security measure um you know if people start yelling it does it just it um causes distress for the children so it kind of helps people temper down their emotions so it's a very very interesting um version of who should be in the room when people are making important like political and social and economic decisions um so the aliens have landed and they um are of the opinion that human beings need to expand into space and to leave their planet behind because a planet is a finite amount of space and a finite amount of resources and no sentient um, species will ever be able to survive forever on a planet. It's inevitable that you will need to expand in order for your species to survive. Here is where like a bunch of these philosophical conversations happen where it's like, okay, the alien species think they are benevolent and you know, it's a very interesting twist on like colonizing a people and thinking that like we are bringing um, civilization to these underdeveloped people. We are bringing education, we are bringing knowledge, we are bringing technology, you know, we are saving them, we are helping them. Therefore, it's okay for us to force these ideas on them because we're doing it with the best of intentions. Um, and the humans of this world having to navigate that and make the case, we got to do this, like, you can't force this on us. It doesn't matter how benevolent, how helpful, how logical your arguments on, it all falls, falls apart if you force this on us. Um, and I, I love the arg part of the argument is we're not ready to leave our planet because we've only just learned how to live in balance with it. We've only just learned how to live within our means. And those are skills that we're going to need if we're living on a space station, if we're living on spaceships. Because even if we do, do go to like other planets and stuff and acquire more resources, like we're, we're actually not ready to leave. The earth still has many lessons to teach us that we need. We're just starting to get it right. Now is not the time to give up on our planet. You know, the, the stakes are again, like very philosophical, very spiritual, very identity driven rather than like physical danger. Um, and yeah, I really, I really liked it. Um, and I, um, uh, he, again, you know, it's another one where I'm like, this is a very specific flavor that's not going to be everyone's cup of tea, but like, I feel like if this is the kind of thing that appeals to you, you're going to love it. I think it's a very excellent version of the the kind of flavor of sci-fi that it is. Um, so, hurrah. Next, we got a cl classic, we got a modern classic, we've got The Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck. Um, so this was part of my Amnesia Reads project where I was rereading books that I knew I had read, but I really didn't remember anything about them. Um, and so this was on there and now I'm like, oh, I gotta read more John Steinbeck. Um, his writing style really works for me. Um, I also listened to this on audiobook and I really enjoyed the, the audiobook narrator of it. Um, so this book follows the Jode family. Um, during the Great Depression in America as they are forced off their land um, and uh, all pack up on this on their car um, to drive west and look for work in California. Um, and interspersed with the chapters of the family are these little vignettes that talk about like just what's going on in the Great Depression. And this is a anti-capitalist manifest manifesto that speaks to my heart in the most frustrating and validating of ways. So I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna read this is like an early vignette that's talking about um, a family that is being forced off their land and basically like the the tractor that's owned by the like industrial bank firm that has purchased this land um, is being like you gotta, you gotta, you're evicted, you have to leave, or I'm going to drive over your home with my tractor because it's in the way of the furrow that I need to plow. So, like, this whole conversation ends with, like, 
you know, the tractor driver saying, it's not me. There's nothing I can do. If I, I'll lose my, my job if I don't do it. And look, suppose you kill me. They just hang you, but long before you're hung, there'll be another guy on the tractor and he'll bump the house down. You're not killing the right guy. That's so, the tenant said. Who gave you orders? I'll go after him. He's the one to kill. You're wrong. He got his orders from the bank. The bank told him, clear those people out or you lose your job. Well, there's the president of the bank. There's a board of directors. I'll fill up the magazine of the rifle and go into the bank. The driver said, fellow, fellow was telling me the bank gets orders from the east. The orders were, make the land show profit or we'll close you up. But where does it stop? Who can we shoot? I don't aim to starve to death before I kill the man that's starving me. I don't know. Maybe there's nobody to shoot. Maybe the thing isn't men at all. Maybe, like you said, the property's doing it. Anyway, I told you my orders. I got to figure, the tenant said. We all got to figure. There's some way to stop this. It's not like it's not like lightning or earthquakes. We've got a bad thing made by men, and by God, that's something we can change. And anyway, it kind of goes on and kind of shows the absurdist futility of the system built by capitalism where it is not a man or even like a single company that owns the land that owns the product so when something goes wrong you can't just ferret out like a bad seed it's the whole fucking system <laughs> it's a whole fucking system anyway um actually this might be the one i talk about the least because it's kind of just like this whole, like you are kind of following the day-to-day -day journey of this family, but you're also seeing the various ways in which, you know, the capitalism for profit, bigger, 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 better, always kind of system just breaks down, especially under, you know, the environmental circumstances of the Great Depression and, you know, what happens when you have a not just an economical model but a social model of placing money above human lives and what the true cost of that looks like and um it's excellent because i think it it portrays it in such uh like a detailed and artful way um it's also so frustrating that like this exact same shit is still happening um and we're like we as a society are just letting it <laughs> we're just letting it and thinking that we don't have power to change it ah. <laughs> but like again like the writing is also very good like i would i like you tell me like yeah you're following the story of this family in the great depression i'm like that sounds like a yawn fest and somehow i was just pulled along with the story and i was like invested in in their survival and their frustration and their rage and their determination like it's again not only is it like the story of um the monster of capitalism but also like amazing determination of the human spirit and just like the the power of um humankind's drive for survival in the face of um insurmountable odds um Yes, it is worthy of its acclaim. Next, we've got another smutty romance. This is The Company of Fiends by Catherine Moon. This is the second book in the Tempting Monster series. Um, this one was so much fun. Um, so this follows a young woman who is human passing, and she is a performer in an erotic theater that pairs human women with paranormal paramours so you know you've got sphinxes and minotaurs and snake men and demons and yetis and like vampires you know what all else you can think of um and one woman from the theater t goes missing and turns up murdered and then another one turns up murdered and they start to discover that this is a pattern somebody is targeting the human women, someone is targeting the theater, um, and it's kind of, a, it's kind of like a, a murder mystery trying to figure out who's doing it, and then once they figure out kind of who's doing it, how, how do we make it stop? How do we reach him? Um, and along the way, you know, this human woman is dealing with her various relationships, and it's, um, a reverse harem 
romance trope where it's one woman and various um, male partners and you know it's not just them and her but some of them and kind of some of them navigating like their interactions with each other um this one has got a little bit more uh queer and fluidness than um book one um and then you know we're also invested in like the the future of this theatrical company which of course i've got a soft spot for because i work in theater um and it was a great time and I'm having a great time with the series and it's one that I kind of want to own physical copies of because I feel like I would absolutely reread it and uh, book three is coming out this year and it's one of my most anticipated books of the year. Uh, I want to know what happens. Um, yes, so it's very steamy, very explicit, very interesting. Um, and I think overall, the overall crafting of the larger plot of like what is going on with the bad guy targeting these women um, is also sol solidly done. Next book I gotta talk about, Black Sun by Rebecca Roanhorse. It took me far too long to finally get around to reading it. Um, so this is a fictional historical fantasy that takes place in a inspired by the civilizations of the pre-Columbian Americas. Um, so it's not strictly like the American Southwest and Mexico and the Caribbean, but it's heavily inspired by um, the cultures that were kind of in the, um, like the Mexican Gulf. Is that what it's called? Gulf of Mexico? So uh, we are following a high priestess of the sun who lives in the capital city of this um, empire, and she is... Um, fairly new to that position and she's fairly young and she's kind of been like a like a social outcast for various reasons so she is dealing with trying to implement some changes um to the society and she's meeting a lot of resistance and eventually that resistance becomes full-out rebellion um we are also following a um queer uh ship captain who has like um magical siren water magic heritage which some sailors are very suspicious of but it also means that you know she can kind of call a good wind or call like good tide so sometimes it kind of depends on like if things are going good they think she's lucky and if things are going bad she's the one they got to chuck overboard so she you know and also like being a woman being in charge of all these men though that seems to be less of the issue like even though like you don't encounter too many other like women ship captains like they have significantly less issue with her being a woman than with the superstitions around her heritage so she gets hired to transport this mythical shaman man um across the ocean in winter in a very short span of time which um means that she can't take the safe route along the coast she has to cross the ocean um which is kind of dangerous in winter because of winter storms um but she is trusting in her magical heritage to try to make it because she's kind of in debt to the person who hired her and also like she's looking for the fame of having completed it she's looking for the money of when she you know delivers her cargo um you know, she's like, fuck, if anyone can do it, it's going to be me. She's kind of got like a, like a bit of a, of a reckless Han Solo vibe going on, except female and queer. Um, her cargo turns out to be this, um, vessel of a crow god. This is, um, a young man who went through a, um, magical ritual at a young age. And part of the ritual left him, um, blinded, though he can still see a little bit with some, um, magical assistance. Um, but he is like this prophetic vessel of a crow god who is supposed to be like in the main city during the eclipse to allow um, like this god, the crow god of darkness to take over. Oh, I'm gonna need to get some bigger batteries for my lights because apparently I talk too long and the batteries don't last. Where was I? He is, yeah, trying to get the crow god to, like, usurp the sun god and take over power. 
Um, so it's all of the, it's these three distinct storylines that are all coming together on the date of convergence, which is basically the solar eclipse. Um, and the ending is kind of like the aftermath of all of that. So I'm super excited for book two to figure out like, well, now what? <laughs> Fuck. Um, and then the next two books are books that snuck in right at the end, the last couple weeks of December. So first up, we've got Autonomous by Annalie Newitz. This is, um, it's cyberpunk, but it's dealing with biotech rather than with like AI or, um, internet stuff. Um, so we're following a woman who is, um, a anti-patent scientist, um, so she's like a, a patent pirate, um, and she mostly tries to, um, manufacture, like, antivirals and, like, cancer treatment drugs that the, uh, pharmaceutical corporations have this, like, intense patent chokehold. Um, where it's like, if you can't pay, then too bad. I guess you're just going to have to fucking die. Um, so she is fighting against that. Um, but the drugs that pay the bills are like the party drugs and like the productivity drugs. And she um, uh, gen reverse gen engineers this brand new productivity drug that ends up uh, having people get addicted to it. And they end up performing whatever like task their brain latches onto basically rep repetitively performing it until they die and it's this like mysterious addiction epidemic that's spreading and people are trying to figure out what's going on because it's like a brand new drug so like not a lot of doctors and stuff know about it um but basically like the the corporations basically like send an assassin after her and this um and the like I mean, I think it's it's not explicit that he's an assassin, but he's, like, supposed to find her and bring her to justice. And this is um, Elias, and he's traveling with a robotic partner, Paladin, um, and there's some interesting stuff in their relationship, like, um, where Elias is kind of anthropomorphizing Paladin and, like, having feelings towards him, and then Paladin is kind of dealing with um, his own sentience and awareness and trying to figure out where that fits in with um how Elias sees him there's some there's like a, some interesting conversations in there that happen that can happen because um you know Paladin is a robot robot and it's like technically sexless but does have like an organic brain um as one of the the parts of his body so that calls into question some things and it's it's an interesting vessel to have some interesting gender conversations um and then um our scientist Jack um so she she kind of knows that like she's if she's not going to jail someone's going to come kill her like she knows her time is up but she's trying to get in contact with people from her like you know college revolutionary days to try to be like can we try to manufacture an antidote and can we try to um have evidence that I didn't make the drug dangerous it was already dangerous before I replicated it. So yes, I broke the law, but there were bigger laws being broke before I touched this thing. Um, so in a similar vein of the Grapes of Wrath, there's a lot of anti-capitalist yelling in here that speaks to me very much. Um, and it's a very interesting um, imagining of the future, especially with the role of um, corporate power in our world. Um, and I had a really great time with it and I need to read more stuff from this author. Um, cause like I said in my, um, December wrap up, I'm like, I like, I like your ideas. I like what your brain's coming up with. I want, I want more. Last one. Um, this is a brand new release. I believe this book was released on January 3rd. This is a young adult fantasy called Song of Silver Flame Like Night by Amelie Wenzhou. Um, this is a Chinese fantasy inspired by um, Chinese folklore. Um, we follow um, a young woman who is living under um, oppressive Atlantean rule. The Atlanteans have like basically invaded her country and are imposing their language and their traditions and trying to like erase um, her, uh, erase the, the native culture there and, Im um, and impose their own. Um, but they're clearly not allowing the native people to be seen as equals. It's a very, um, 
colonized, they're building this very, like, colonized or dominated society. Um, and she um, has access to this mysterious magic that was kind of, she doesn't really know what it is, where it came from. It has, like, the magic has something to do with, like, why this Elantian sorcerer killed her mother and she's desperately searching for answers and in that search she crosses path with crosses paths with a young man who is from like the last surviving magical school that um trains that works in this magic so there's there's things about her that he doesn't really understand so he's trying to get her back to the school to, so that the, the masters of the school can kind of figure out what's going on with her um, and she you know she there's a lot about him that she doesn't trust but he is the first person that she's encountered who knows anything about um, like what this magic symbol is on her body um, and so the the magic system is based on chi which is the the life energy of all living things and there's you know the chi of the giving life and the chi of like death and darkness and it's all about like the balance of the two. Uh, part of this is, um, so the girl's mother was trying to find, um, these four ancient demon gods trying to harness their power, um, and then, like, the, the sorcerer who killed her mother is also in pursuit of them, um, because he's trying to harness that power for himself. You know, he definitely sees their magic as inferior, but he's kind of like, ah, but, but there's something here and I want it for myself. <laughs> so th we've got the story of a lot of, um, like, philosophical push and pull of, like, should we try to harness this power or no, is it too dangerous or we absolutely need to because otherwise, you know, the Atlanteans are basically going to wipe us out. Um, but, you know, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Um, and it's a first in the series. It's not a debut. This author does have another um, completed series out, but this one, it's got a, a lot, like she talks about, um, like this is a lot of this is drawn from like Chinese history that resonates very deeply with like within her own family and her own heritage. Um, so you can I can definitely feel um, the the like personal patch and personal stakes that are in this story. I think it's really well crafted. Um, I do think there's like a little bit of like pacing issues once she's kind of on the run with the the guy. I think there's like. Uh, there's like some info dumping that kind of screws with the pacing, but it's also like, but it's like, how else would you kind of convey this information? Like I, I, but like overall I was reading this and being like, this is the caliber of young adult fantasy that I want. Um, this is another thing that I talked about in my, um, December wrap up where suddenly I was comparing it to like another recent, like young adult fantasy and realizing that that one's just fine. This one is very fucking good. Um, so for that and um it just got me very excited and i'm so um excited to have like another series that i'm interested in continuing on and will look forward to its career with great interest um so there we go that's number 10 on this list ah we fucking made it all right oh oh i had some fucking reminders and the post-its were on the other page, so I forgot to tell them. So here we go. A couple, little bit of housekeeping. Um, so as of the time that I'm filming this video, the HarperCollins workers are still on strike. HarperCollins is one of the big publishers, and a bunch of their workers have been on strike since before Thanksgiving, and they are still without um, a signed contract. So I will have information in my description box about to learn more about the strike and what the workers are asking for and how you can support them. Um, so just want to draw your attention to that. And second, since this is a list of books, um, uh, I now have um, affiliate links for these books through um, bookshop.org. Um, so um, absolutely no expectation for anyone to like click through them if you are, if you are interested in buying any of these books absolutely no expectation that you would like click through and use these links um but i I've, I've had them up there and i've just been forgetting to talk about them so here's the deal so um i realized that with um bookshop.org like they didn't have any minimum requirements for 
um, like influencers and reviewers get uh, getting affiliate links. Like you just kind of have to have to sign up, and they and I think there's like a, maybe like in 24 hours or something, they just do a little bit of like an approval process, and there you go. Um, so what that means now is, if you go into my description box and you click on the link to one of these books, and let's say you then decide to buy that book, or maybe like if you click through there and then decide to buy something else, with each purchase I would make a small commission. I have no idea what the size that commission is, but I imagine it is like pennies on the purchase. But again, like no pressure to do that. I have tried in the description box to make it very, very clear that these are affiliate links and that is what would happen. Um, if, if, if you look at that and you're like, actually, you could make it more clear by phrasing it this way or by doing this, please leave me suggestion thing. But I just wanted to make sure at some point in one of my videos, um, I verbally alerted you to those links being there and what the deal is with them. And yeah, yeah. Um, but also like letting you know if you are also a very small creator, um, sometimes those affiliate links, they like require that you have like a thousand subscribers or something um and the bookshop.org one did not like a size requirement um also with the affiliate program like i have like i have like a loudly curates bookshop and on there i can make lists so i have um a list of my um, 2021 fiction and nonfiction favorites, if that was something you wanted to peruse, if you wanted to peruse curated lists on that website. And I think the same thing applies where like if you went into one of those lists and ended up purchasing one of the books from that list, that little tiny bit of commission uh, would be applied to that purchase. Um, it doesn't cost you anything more, but it is like a little bit of like it's a little bit of like giving credit that like hey this is the reviewer who um inspired me to look into getting a copy of this book so okay housekeeping done now we can complete the outro that's it <laughs> that's the video um i hope you enjoyed it uh let me know if any of these were also like your favorites of the year or the favorites of whatever year you read them in because a lot of these are a little bit older titles um i'd love to know um, I hope you have a good rest of your day. I encourage you to go out into the world and be curious. I will have my social media and other places where you can find me in the, in the description box below. And I will catch you folks in my next video. Bye!